Good afternoon, Good. and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tim Lee. I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on silver exploration and development today. We will hear from Jorge Ramiro Monroy, Lauren McGaw, and Peter McGaw of Reina Silver. During today's web webinar, they will provide an overview and outlook, then we will take questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first we need to discuss uh, some fine print during this RAINA webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the RAINA corporate presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, rainasilver.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors, and participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures pertaining to Reina. So we have Reina Silver presenting today. The company has a portfolio of projects in Mexico and Nevada. Uh, three leading projects include the Gigi project in Chihuahua State, Mexico, where the company is searching for the buried source of a long producing silver mining district. Uh, the Batapilas project, where it is drilling high grade veins. And now the Medicine Springs project is emerging in Nevada, where it is also looking for a potential buried giant. With that, I now turn it over to Jorge uh, to update our audience on the company. Uh, thank you, Tim, for, for the introduction. And it's a, a pleasure to have everybody for, for this webinar for Reina Silver. I'll, I'll just give a very brief introduction, particularly for those of you who might be new to the Reina Silver story. And if we could go to the next slide, I'll, on behalf of all the speakers, I'll, we will be making forward-looking statements, so please do your own uh, research before you consider investing in, in our company. Uh, if we can go to the to the next slide, the you know I just wanted to give a very brief introduction of uh, what our company is all about, how we got started. We started as a company in 2018, and um, you know what was happening at the time was you know we realized that uh, if you can remember silver in in those years had been in, in a bear market where silver producers had been really struggling to, you know, to produce at a, at, a, at a profit. It really had been break even or some years even producing at a loss. As a result of that, very little exploration, uh, money available for silver projects so for, for a long time, for many, many years. So at that point, uh, I reached out to, to Peter, Peter McGaugh, who will be speaking with us in, in a minute, and we'll introduce him as well in a minute. Uh, that's him. <laughs> and I said, Peter, help me find, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what companies are always looking for in the silver space is 100 million ounces of silver. So you can mine silver, 10 million ounces of silver for 10 years. That, that's really the, the, the point at which it's efficient to, to have uh, for a large cap company, you know, to, to, to have a project. You know, we helped me find a 100 million ounce silver producer and, and, and Peter rightly so said to me, look, they're simply just not laying around. Anything that you'll find right now will be projects uh, with, yes, with that uh, uh, tonnage, but with very low grade that need, you know, uh, very high silver price to, to, make, um, uh, to make sense. So Peter said to me, what I would encourage you to do as an entrepreneur is if you really want that kind of project, you have to go and look for it. And he explained to me how you know, he has strong belief that there's a, still a lot of projects yet to be discovered. And he mentioned to me two of them that were dear to his heart, uh, being that he had put them together uh, in the late 1990s, uh, in, even, even before the Max Silver IPO. And those two projects are Gigi and Batopilas. Uh, Gigi um, it was Peter's uh, doctoral thesis. Uh, Batopilas was... Um, um, formerly Mexico's highest grade silver mine. So we, we did a deal with Max Silver, took the company public in 2020, and brought a, a third project to, to the company called Medicine Springs. And really the, the value proposition of the company is 
looking for high grade silver, uh, focusing on, on, on high margin projects, projects that are in the vicinity, uh, either themselves were a former producer or in the vicinity of, uh, of a historic producer that uh, really has had very little to no exploration in modern times. And, you know, using uh, Peter and the team's expertise in, in exploration, trying to uh, establish our projects as, as true candidates for a district scale uh, silver, uh, high grade silver discovery. So with that brief introduction, I wanted to, to give the, the, the microphone to Lauren McGaw. Lauren is our head of investor relations. She's also, uh, as you might be able to tell, uh, Peter's daughter. She's a, a brilliant geologist, and she'll be work, walking us through the the beginning of of, of a presentation. So, uh, welcome, Lauren. Oh, thank you, Jorge. That was very sweet of you to say, and uh, I can definitely. Uh, admit to having a lifelong learning about geology, in particular the projects that we're we're looking at today. Uh, you know, when you have projects like we have, that's part of where you get a team that looks at that district scale, sees how much bigger these systems can be than what was previously thought, and that's one of the reasons why if you've got a serially successful team of geologists. Yes, my father is the exploration team lead, but. We also have the geos that are on the ground. These are some of the guys that were, you know, there as part of the other big discoveries. And it's because of the team, it's because of the projects that we've got the strong support that we do, both institutionally as well as long holding investors that allows us to have the funding that we need so that we can go and drill and we can really create that value for our investors. So just to go a little bit more in depth into the three projects that we have, we've got Batapilas and Gigi. Those are the two that are down in Chihuahua. Those were the ones that were part of the initial Mag Silver IPO. Gigi is, we believe, the missing half of the CRD spectrum in the Santo Lalia district, which is a district that produced half a billion ounces of silver historically. And our question is, where's the other half of this thing? We completed phase one and two of drilling. Uh, we made two major discoveries within within that uh, time period. Um, we've got a sulfide scar and mineralization footprint of over half a square kilometer, and we're moving forward towards a phase three 8,000 meter drilling program that's fully funded. Uh, Botapilis is our other project in Chihuahua. That's actually a native silver district. So they were mining this absolutely brilliant uh, native silver, almost Brillo pad style of mineralization, absolutely mind boggling. And, you know, we went in and we said, okay, we know that the historic district produced this crazy high grade silver. How much bigger does this system get? And, you know, we did a trenching program. We got samples that came back 305 grams to 42 kilo silver. We followed this up with drilling. We found additional high grade silver mineralization and extension of one of the veins that's important historically. And then on top of that, for the first time ever, we found gold. So we now have this gold zone that has developed up into the Northeast. We're able to use that to potentially figure out how much bigger this thing is, how much more complex, and potentially, you know, see what's possible there. So we've got a drilling program finishing up uh, that we'll be working on finishing up there uh, as well. And then our third project, which is the reason why I got originally involved with Reina, is Medicine Springs. And that's up in Nevada near the Elko area an area that's historically famous for big copper porphyries. But our question was, could there also be another one of these carbonate replacement deposits, one of these big monsters lurking here or there? So we did a big Jasperoid study because there's these features that we can utilize to really strategically and in a disciplined fashion look at the mineralization. And we found this absolutely exquisite zone district scale mineralization footprint. So really looking forward to our phase one drilling program that's coming up. Uh, this fall so that we can see whether or not we're right about whether or not there's potentially another CRD monster. Uh, we're really lucky to have some great technical advisors. Uh, I did a gush about my father a little bit. Um, you know, he's made a name for himself by taking the academic work that he you, that he did at Santo Lalia, which is where our Gigi project is, 
on a thesis studying carbonate replacement deposits and the idea that we could strategically go after blind CRDs, that we could figure out where the rest of the spectrum is, really looking at the full ore systems approach to exploration, which is another way of saying district scale exploration. And he's also made some big uh, discoveries in other styles of deposits like Juan Escipio, which is the big, and Val de Cañas, which are the big mag silver um, Cinderella stories as they were, as well as we also have uh, Mr. Kerwin, uh, who's famous in his own right as the v ex uh, VP of Ivanhoe um, and his major discovery. So we've got the good resources behind us, but we also have geologists on the ground who are running the two programs. We've got Rene Ramirez, which is one of the top exploration geologists in Mexico. He's running our Gigi project. He was a major part of the Potosa discovery for Exelon and Juan Escipio for Mag Silver. And then we've also got Manuel Ruiz, who's running our Baraquilas project. And you know he was a huge part at the Cinco de Mayo discovery for Mag as well. And then we're on the other side, on the more executive capital side, we've got Jorge, who is our CEO, and he's done a fantastic job of developing a well-curated um, invest, investor uh, base. Because when you're exploring on this scale, you need people who are believers in the long-term aspects of uh, this style of exploration so that you can have the ability to go and look at these in a systematic, disciplined way. Uh, and that's because the core philosophy behind our exploration model is to go after high grade district scale. We're looking at finding something that makes a significant dent in the market. We're looking at something that's got high enough margin that it can make money when silver is at your worst nightmare and can really make money when silver is at whatever your dreams are made of. And to do that, it has to be a big enough system that it can survive multiple market cycles as so that it can take advantage of multiple market cycles as well. And that requires a certain philosophy and a certain mindset in terms of how you explore. And we believe that we've got the elements to find one of these big things that's really a game changer. So I'm gonna pass this off to my dad so that he can talk to you guys about the projects that we have in a more semi-technical fashion and uh before speaking yeah okay well thank you lauren and i'm gonna ask can people hear me you're good all right so let's start with bottle pilas uh this is a historic as lauren noted native silver district uh it's produced an estimated 300 million ounces of silver, an average grade of 1,500 grams, which is a bit misleading because 90% of the production of this district came from less than 10% of the ore that was mined because that ore was essentially Brillo pads of native silver. Over here on the left, we see um, what a month's production looked like back in 1906, uh, 350,000 ounces of fine silver. Um, truly remarkable district in terms of the grade, the fact that there's 30 known veins that were produced intermittently from 1632 to 1912. And basically not much has happened since, except for a little exploration since 1912. Um, this is sort of the timeline, 1912, 1913, the mine was closed uh, by the Mexican revolution. Uh, this was the close, this was the end of the, um, what we call the silver magnet era. This was the Botapilas Mining Company, and Jorge will probably mention later on that uh, there is um, a book called The Silver Magnet that that um, is is a good history of how things operated in the late 1800s. Uh, the Spanish historic mining, essentially, they found silver in outcrop. They followed it down as far as their technology allowed. That was a lot of silver produced in that era. Probably 80% of the district's production came from the, the Spanish historic era. Then the Porfirio Diaz tunnel was dug by Botapilas Mining Company to come in under those veins. They mined essentially from those veins upwards from the bottom rather than downwards from the top. And then they followed them below the level of the tunnel. That required pumping. The Mexican Revolution happened in 1913. The hydroelectric dam was destroyed. The mine flooded, and it's been that way ever since. 
Uh, the district had fragmented in terms of its land ownership. Uh, we put that together back in the late 1900s, 1990s, uh, put that into MAG in 2003. MAG did a certain amount of work, did some drilling. But Botopilis, like Gigi, was a victim of MAG's success at Ron Scipio. MAG did not have, uh, they wanted to conserve and focus their resources on developing Ron Scipio. So when Jorge came along and said, I'm interested in picking up these properties, that was appealing to MAG. And that's how Reina got the properties. Uh, since then, uh, we've been exploring the property, starting with some trenching on the surface, on the projection of no ve known veins, as Lauren mentioned, and we found native silver in blind outcrop uh, by trenching. Uh, and then we found the gold zone, and we've continued to do some, some drilling, enough to tell us that we need to do some more work to understand uh, the overall controls on this system so that we can explore more effectively. Uh, this map shows you um, the, the district and our land holdings within it. We control pretty much everything you see in blue in the little map on the upper right hand side. And the map on the lower left shows the silver zone. That big straight purple line you see on there is the trace of the Porfirio Diaz tunnel. So that came in at river level underneath a whole series of veins that were mined from the surface down. To the northeast up there in the upper right hand corner is the gold zone. Uh, this was something we found pretty much by surprise in the process of surface mapping and some drilling. Uh, got up to better than 20 grams of gold uh, in some of these surface workings. And then in between those two is the gold and silver zone where both gold and silver occupy pretty much the same plumbing system, but they occupied it at different times. So what we're faced with is a situation where we have overlapping gold and silver mineralization. We're trying to figure out whether they're related to each other or whether they occurred sequentially and in which order that sequence happened. Uh, some examples from our, our drilling done in, in, in 21, um, some pretty nice widths, one and a half meters, almost seven grams gold, some narrower zones up to 19 grams. Uh, and then in um, hole 42, uh, more examples of the same kind of thing, most importantly being this zone here, coherent zone, 3.6 meters at 8 grams gold. Uh, that's the kind of thing that would be underground mineable anywhere in the world. Uh, so that tells us that we're in the right kind of place uh, to be taking the gold seriously as well as the silver. Just some shots of core on the left, the silver zone, uh, that stuff that you see with the, the pocket knife in between that's essentially massive native silver and calcite so that zone ran a little better than 10 kilograms silver uh, and then on the right you can see the gold zone which is not very prepossessing but those narrow little quartz veins that you see in there and the lacing that you see through that core is what carries an average of eight grams of gold um, moving on to Gigi, and this is the first of our two carbonate replacement deposits. Gigi and Medicine Springs are both CRDs. Uh, these are a deposit type that are the backbone of the Mexican underground mining, base metal mining business, and have been for a long time. They used to be important in the Western U.S., uh, and they're regaining some, some traction now. Uh, in large part because of the Taylor discovery by Arizona Mining, which South 32 bought for one and a half billion dollars. So people suddenly recognize, wait a minute, this is a deposit type I need to pay attention to. Uh, and these deposits are fairly, in, in, this, in this model, are fairly simple, but you have a source intrusion shown in pink at the bottom that's surrounded in red by high temperature alteration. Uh, which in turn is overprinted by the sulfide mineralization that we care about. As you work outward from that into that red and ultimately the yellow zone, you have a transition towards higher and higher silver grades um, uh, in the chimney and manto zones. Um, and essentially exploration in our particular case, because they mine, they found the mantos in outcrop in 1703 and they followed them down um, through the chimney zone, we're looking at Gigi for the source of that. But what's important is that unless there's post-mineral faulting, mineralization is continuous 
from wherever you find it back to the source. And it contains large zones of high grade mineralization. As you get closer to the source, the grade goes down a little bit, but the volume goes up. So there's a trade off between volume and grade, and that's a perfectly acceptable trade off. So, as they say, the best place to find a mine is in the shadow of a head frame. Uh, this is the Inglaterra shaft in the Santa Eulalia district. This is basically the southernmost production shaft in the district. This district was productive from 1703 until 2021 when it got shut down by COVID, although there's still small scale mining going on now. Historically, produced about 52 million ounces of, of 52 million tons of ore, uh, producing a little better than a half a billion ounces of silver and about almost 8 million metric tons of lead and zinc. That gave you a historic grade of 310 grams or 10 ounces silver and 15% combined lead and zinc. High grade by any standards. So plugging what we know of Gigi into that model that I showed you, what you see on the upper left hand side is the chimney manto zone, what we call the most distal part or distant part of the system. That's what produced these the, the, the 50 million tons of mineralization. And we're looking for that source intrusion that drove the system. Now, it's a bit of a challenge because we don't get to see the host rocks on the surface. There are pre-mineral volcanic rocks on the surface that have seen alteration and there's cracks that run through it that have bled mineralization out from underneath. But we're trying to find this target that's about a kilometer, maybe a kilometer and a half in diameter, surrounded by high-grade scarn underneath this blanket of alteration uh, that we're trying to see through to figure out where that's part of the system is. So this is all an outflow, as Lauren mentioned, of my doctoral work uh, where I studied this district in detail back in the 1980s. We brought mag silver in in the early 2000s. Uh, we did a bunch of geophysics. We did a few holes uh, based on some of the early geophysics. We understand why the geophysical anomalies were there. We also understand now that those geophysical anomalies, at least some of them, did not correspond to mineralization, but they corresponded to understandable geologic features. Again, Gigi got backburnered because of the success at Juan Escipio. It came into Reina's hands in 2018. Jorge fairly quickly acquired another piece of property adjoining it uh, to expand the property position. And we've been exploring the property ever since we put in a 12,000 meter phase one program, another 8,000 meters in phase two, and we're getting ready for phase three. Here's a, here's a map of the area, uh, the historic, uh, I don't think you can see my cursor, can you? No. Okay, so in the upper left hand, the, the blue is the, the property we have on the, the left hand map. The right hand map is a, is a close up of the north central part of the claim. The historic west camp where I showed you in that long section a minute ago with the chimney mantos is in the upper left hand side of that square uh, that you see there that has the vertical line running through the middle of it. Uh, that's where the historic production came from. And you can see the drill holes uh, quite distant from that square. That's mostly where the mag drilling was, was done. We've now focused in on the area shown in the map on the right. And it's worth pointing out the scale here. These holes are spaced anywhere from 400 to 1200 meters apart. So there's this is broad scale drilling. We're not trying to drill off a resource yet. We're trying to pin down that source part of the system because then that will allow us to work from the source back toward the historically known part of the district. And there's every reason to think mineralization should be continuous uh, through that spectrum. Here is a section, that long section or that blue line shown in the map on the left, the north-south line. Uh, a is at the top. And when you look at the right, that shows the results of the drilling in very broad sense. That hot pink at the bottom is high temperature scarn alteration. It's mineralized. It's up to 50 meters thick. Uh, it's got some good high grade multiple stage mineralization and scar and alteration in it. This is the kind of stuff you expect to see when you're getting close to what you're looking for. 
as far as the source is concerned. But very important, perhaps equally important, is those red circles higher up the holes. Those are, those are high silver intercepts in the limestone. Uh, so we have a 1,200 meter thick section of limestone, which is the host rock for the district. Uh, we have the scarn that's showing up at depth, sort of toward the bottom of that sequence. Uh, but then in the middle of it, the same elevation where the historic mining occurred in the West Camp, we're seeing the kinds of sulfide bearing veins and silver bearing alteration. That's the kind of thing peripheral to those significant ore bodies. So there's a possibility in this area that we will find more massive sulfide mineralization of the historic side above this deep source zone that we're looking for with the deeper holes. So this gives us two target horizons to work for, which means we get it, if we plan the drill holes, we get a twofer out of every hole. And that's a nice thing to have in exploration. Uh, just some, some of the results uh, showing what we've gotten so far uh, is getting a little hard to see, but there's two meters in the upper zone shown in red with the same line on the bot on the left hand side as you see in the, in the previous diagram. Two meters of 233 grams silver, four and a half meters of 100 grams silver. These aren't going to make it for mining themselves, but this is the kind of thing that the old timers used to follow into major ore bodies. So we're very excited by these results. Below that, with the hot pink line on the left, are the results from the SCARN interval. And you can see overall, we've got 35 meters of, of 40 gram silver with two and a half lead, zinc, half a, half a percent of silver, uh, excuse me, of, of lead. Uh, but then that's got a series of higher grade zones within it, one of which runs over a kilogram of silver, another one runs six. 16% zinc. Uh, there's a copper zone in there that runs 2% copper. So what this is telling us is multiple stages of mineralization, which is characteristic of a big CRD system. Uh, so when we put the pieces together, everything tells us we're getting very close, not just to the source, but to additional high grade mineralization much closer to the surface. Uh, some more some more assays just the picture on the right showing you what that high grade silver mineralization looks like affecting uh scarn in this particular case very good uh grades from a number of these holes 9 11 6 percent zinc 184 500 grams silver uh anywhere from half a percent to three four percent lead the right kind of range of grades we just need to see this over bigger intervals, and that's what we're looking for. So we take that same model that we've used in Mexico. We've made major discoveries in other districts in Mexico. Um, we found the Cinco de Mayo project completely blind. Uh, Platosa that I worked on with Rene, um, the, what was the highest grade mine in Mexico. And we're taking this model to central Nevada or north central Nevada, as Lauren mentioned. So this is an area where historically there are porphyry copper. So that source intrusion that you see in the model becomes a potential target in and of itself. We have things like the Ely district, the Eureka district, both of which have, have historically productive porphyries in their center. And because they're emplaced in carbonate sequences, they have the same kind of CRD mineralization surrounding the intrusion as we see in Santa Eulalia and other places, or we're looking for in Santa Eulalia. And we do see it at Taylor, and we do see it resolution, and we do see it Bingham, uh, which is not very far away. The situation here, though, is we are at the very outskirts of the system. So wherever the system is, it's lurking underneath um, a little thickness of, of of rocks that we have to get through. But fortunately, there's a lot of stuff that's come up through it. So here's our model again at Medicine Springs. We're up in that zone in the top center part of the model that says veins. So that's what we're seeing. And we're, we're expecting that the whole rest of the system remains uh, at depth. When we look at Medicine Springs compared to major CRD systems all over the world, we can tick 11 out of the 13 important boxes that say it's here. Location is the first one. We're on Main Street in terms of porphyry copper belt. We're at the top of the carbonate section. We know from regional stratigraphy, we have thousand meter or more of potentially favorable host rocks below us. 
we've got high silver grades. We've got over 400 grams silver in historic drilling and in dump sampling. And we can tick off a number of these other features, like I've mentioned already, multiple mineralization and alteration stages, presence of felsic intrusions, presence of scar. Uh, high iron sphalerite is something we're looking for, but these are all pieces of the puzzle that are coming together before we've even drilled a hole. So at Medicine Springs, the system is laced by a series of northeast trending structures, which were the main fluid channel pathways. And jasperoid, which is just silicified limestone that picks up residual metals from the spent ore fluids, occur along each one of those structures. The property is actually blanketed by these things. And we did a detailed study of of the jasperoids, systematic sampling of them, looking at their geochemistry, 850 samples property wide. What you see here are about the 150 to 200 samples that gave us strong results. So we immediately were able to focus where we're working in the district in this corridor, in the sort of northwest central part of the claim. We have the nice northeast controlling uh, structural uh, fabric to the system, and we can see zoning from silver to lead zinc towards copper. That's a classic zoning pattern for a CRD system, especially one that's associated with the porphyry copper. Now that dashed line that you see cutting off the contours on the geochemical results is the limit of outcrop. So everything to the northeast of that, to the north, the, to the upper right corner of the diagram, is essentially blanketed by young cover, except for this one little hill that sticks out in the middle of it. And calling it a hill is probably being generous. It's only about three times higher than I am tall. There's a little outcrop on that hill with a jasperoid in it that ran probably the best copper value we got off the property. So we're very excited about being able to drill starting in the area where we can see things within the copper, zinc, and, and silver zone, but then expect that the system is symmetrical and repeats undercover to the northeast. So we're we're gearing up to um, we're gearing up to drill there. We're in the process of putting the permits together. We've done a little more sampling since this. We've planned out our drilling program. So we're going to start with a series of holes designed to drill underneath historic high grade results at much greater depth than's ever been drilled before. About the deepest hole drilled on the property in the mineralized zone is about a hundred meters. So very, very shallow uh, exploration. We will be drilling much deeper than that and we'll continue the whole, at least one or two of the first holes to probably a kilometer to make sure that we understand what the carbonate section that's the potential host rock that sits underneath this looks like. So very early stage, but the pieces on this one are falling together very nicely. And uh, it's a very exciting project to be involved with. And having said too much for too long, I'm gonna pass it back to Jorge to talk about the capital structure. Thank you, Peter. And uh, can just go for a moment, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, great. So yeah, so as many of you might know, we just finished uh, uh, capital raising uh, where we raised $5 million at 36 cents. With that, our capital structure is that we have uh, 116 million shares outstanding and we have roughly 10 million in cash in the bank. And uh, the one thing I wanted to to note about our, our, our race was, you know, it was largely taken by institutions. We uh, welcome new institutions, but also we had, I would say, close to half of the race taken by institutions who have participated in many cases from um, even from our uh, pre-IPO round. So, you know, I, th I think there is a big belief in the portfolio projects. And, um, you know, that that's uh, something you can see from from the investors that you see um, in the in our in our presentation. And then, you know, lastly, to give you a little bit of a sense, uh, we've uh, discussed it briefly, but what you can look forward from, from the company is uh, we'll be gearing up for drilling in all three of our properties. At Gigi, we have uh, a plan phase three of drilling, which is 8,000 meters. Uh, at the moment, we're doing a, a geophysics campaign 
uh, doing some uh, reinterpretation work to give us a little more uh, precision on on our targets. But uh, you know, we'll be ready to resume drilling shortly. We're doing similar work at Batupilas, where we have about uh, 3,000 meters left uh, to complete our stage one of, of drilling. What happened was uh, a few months ago, as you might remember, we encountered significant gold mineralization from drilling, and we want to have a better understanding of the relationship uh, uh, between the the gold and the silver discoveries. And you know, at, over, over the last two to three months, our teams has, has been working very hard in developing uh, uh, new targets. It's um, it's incredible. Uh, you know, we'll be putting a press release soon with uh, you know with some of the the, the new targets that, that we've uh, developed. But it really is incredible the the, the you know the, the amount of, uh, of of targets in in the property, and you know it's a it's a historic property that, that produced an incredible amount of silver, and, and really this is the first time that we've been able to do such a comprehensive um, uh, geological work in in the whole property. And then very exciting at, at Medicine Springs, we're just about to uh, to receive our drill permits. Um, it, it will. It's. Uh, it's. Uh, we'll be receiving receiving them. Uh, we expect imminently, and then we're planning to start drilling uh, in in the early fall, in in basically in in in, in six to, to eight weeks. We should start drilling there, and then our, our goal is to do between five and seven thousand meters before year end. And you know, and this is a again uh, Peter mentioned. It's a very exciting uh, project. I think um, the, the big message that I would leave you with if you're considering in investing in our company or, or if you're already a shareholder is, you know, we've put together an exceptional portfolio of three district scale uh, projects. I think each of these projects would be strong enough to be its own company. We believe we, we are walking into a market where, you know, the, the supply of, of silver is going to, is going to be, um, um, you know, constrained, but but the supply of silver projects is already um, you know not available. As a result of that, you are seeing you know the the mid tier and and senior silver producers having to go and buy gold projects because you know once you reach a certain market cap, you, you need a a project that's big enough. So I I think we we are um, through the work we're doing, we're addressing a, a very specific need in the market for large scale and high grade uh, projects. So with that, I'll, you know, thank everybody for participating uh, and pass the, the microphone back to Tim. I believe we have a few questions. Great. Thank you all very much for the informative presentation. Uh, we will now begin the Q and a uh, portion of the webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line, that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, we already do have a few questions. Uh, maybe we'll start with Bajapilas um, and perhaps think about the source here of, of the mineralized system there. But do you, do you think Bajapilas could potentially host a, a porphyry, uh, porphyry copper system as well? Uh, well, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there actually is a known porphyry copper in the Bajapilas system. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears to have been faulted uh, prior to the emplacement of the silver veins. So it probably not related to the silver mineralization, but some of the gold veins look like they may have been affected by the same faulting that affected the porphyry. So the possibility is that the gold veins are related to the porphyry. Uh, should note that only the top of the porphyry has been found because it's slightly displaced from wherever the roots are. So the potential exists uh, for that to be a target in the area as well. But that's really not the focus. We're really focused on the high grade silver and gold portions of the system. Obviously, understanding these ore systems as an integrated whole is very important. So. Yes, there's some kind of driver out there, whether it's the porphyry we know or another porphyry, we don't know yet. Um, but that's the right kind of way to think about district scale exploration is you have a source and a district play is trying to find all of the mineralization related to that source that you possibly can. Great. 
And one question here, um, I'll, I'll read it as it's as it's phrased here, but at Gigi and also Batopilas, you don't seem to have traced back from the existing mine workings or mineralization. Am I mistaken? And if not, why haven't you followed existing mineralization outwards? Um, you are correct and you're also mistaken. Uh, so, uh, the, the 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 point is that all of it gigi for example all of the vectors we're using that take us in the direction of where the source is is based on detailed systematic study of the known part of the system that's what i did my doctorate on all the indications geological isotopic geochemical geometric all point back in the direction where we're drilling so in effect we are projecting from the known mineralization towards its unknown source. Part of the reason we're not doing it directly is there's somebody else who owns a piece of the property between the end of the old mineralization and our property. So uh, we're not in the position to be able to simply tack on to the end of the existing workings. Uh, as far as Botopilis is concerned, Again, we the historically exploration in that district expression. So we're trying to bring a more uh, more modern approach to exploration in the district. So what we did when we started out was to project several of the known structures from areas where they had been mined into areas where they had neither been mined nor systematically explored. That's where we did our initial trenching program. That's where we found native silver and outcrop in one of our trenches and then began drilling from there. And that's what led us also into the gold zone. So when you're doing district scale exploration to one, at one degree, it makes sense to just keep following what's been known before. But what's more important is to step back and try to understand the forest so that you understand the overall controls on the district scale and that allows you then to focus in on the individual pieces later on. And you can work back and forth between those two different approaches. And what that has done for us at Botopilis, as I just said, is it's brought us to more silver, but it's also brought us to the gold that we didn't know about before. And, and we wouldn't have found the gold if we hadn't taken that approach. Great. And one more open-ended question here. Um, but what do you know now about Santa Eulalia that you didn't a year ago? Are you surprised by any of the recent results at Gigi? Oh, am I surprised? No. Am I pleased? Absolutely. Uh, what do we know now that we didn't know a year ago? Well, historically, we knew about a certain stage of the intrusion that was temporarily closely associated with mineralization we have found what appears to be the precursor of that intrusion. So we're working our way back upstream as far as the different intrusive phases have been concerned. And it turns out that that intrusive phase is more or less where we thought it was. It's probably still one step removed from the source of the main mineralization stage. And the real surprise was that we wound up with 50 meters of pervasive high temperature scarn alteration affecting that intrusion. Normally you expect to see scarns in carbonate rocks. Scarn represents very substantial importation of other elements from the ore fluids into, into the rocks to change things. To affect a intrusive rock with that kind of degree of calc silicate alteration, clearly multiple stage, clearly multiply mineralized, that's telling us that we're getting very close to whatever source of this system is pumping the juice into the part that we care about. So it's what we hope to find. It's not our ultimate goal, but it's telling us we're well on the road towards, towards getting there. So it, it's hard to call it a surprise. It, it's very welcome, I think, is the best way to put it. It's what, it's what you hope for when you do exploration. Absolutely. Great. Um, oh, and I should have mentioned the upper level mineralization in the limestones at higher levels, that's 
that that was a surprise. I mean, I, I suppose I could have said, yeah, maybe there's something like that. But to find it where we found it, directly above the best deep scarn mineralization, that's te- that's that's potentially unlocking a whole new zone like the historic part of the district in an area that's seen zero exploration, zero drilling, and 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 zero production historically. So if we're right and there's something in there. We've got it all, and it's potentially the same kind of grade and tonnage as came out of the historic part of the district. Great. And looking at the drilling plans at at Gigi, um, are you going to continue to um, kind of conduct exploration holes, or will you now uh, step out uh, kind of a little tighter from some of those holes that encountered mineralization there? Uh, probably a combination of both. We're going to keep looking for that source. We think we have some vectors that are carrying us in that direction. That's why we're doing additional geophysics and reinterpreting the historic geophysics. I mean, one of the things we inherited from MAG was some very sophisticated geophysics that had been flown, had a bunch of anomalies in it, had never been drilled. We've now drilled several of those anomalies. A couple of them appear to be closely linked to the results that we're getting. In other words, we can explain those anomalies in a very favorable way. So we want to look at those in detail now that we have some ground truth that we can apply to those and then use that information to the new geophysics and the existing geophysics to figure out which additional targets to go for. So that's that's the continue to step out and look for the source. At the same time, we have these upper level high sulfide, high silver, uh, potentially sulfide proximal uh, replacement mineralization, proximal kind of features. And we definitely intend to put in some shallower holes in that area, trying to track those down. We're, we're still not in the position to do anything that you would call resource drilling. We're, this is still exploration, trying to understand the overall framework of the district. Once we have the framework down, we can start fleshing out resources in wherever it turns out we have the best results. And one question here, um, obviously you had mentioned when we talked about stepping out from the the mine workings, um, is there any potential to acquire additional claims between the historic mines and your property at Gigi? Yeah, let me address that question. And, you know, we certainly, um, um, you know, we do believe that we have the, uh, you know, the sort of the meat of, of the project, but uh, we're always uh, looking for there's uh, you know little claims here and there that are of interest to us, and we're uh, always uh, discussing with with owners and seeing if you can always uh, get some sort of option agreement. And uh, in some cases, we've uh, had an opportunity to do conduct uh, side visits and collect samples before we can make a decision as to whether you know that's it's a property that's worth it or not. And you know that that we have been. Um, uh, conducting those efforts both at Gigi and Matapilas over the last few months and and certainly something that we're looking at. Great. Um, and then a question here kind of on the overall corporate level, but I think you had mentioned on one of the slides, but how much cash do you currently have yep. on hand and, and how roughly, far will you? R- roughly t- t- uh, 10 million Canadian and um, that's basically, you know, uh, we have a budget for the next uh, 12 uh, months, starting, let's say, we call it uh, from July to July, where we would see, you know, the, the drilling that I mentioned in, uh, before. Uh, so drilling at all three projects and, uh, and still leaves us with a little bit of a cushion of uh, about a million Canadian. Um, and looking forward a little bit here, when might we expect more results from the drilling at Gigi and, and Batupilas? Yeah, so I think, I think uh, you know, the, the uh, most likely to be towards the end of the year. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, we'll do our, our best to, to have uh, drill results towards the end of the year. Um, and um, if um, we'll be able to um, give more specific dates once we uh, finalize our, our starting dates on, on all, all of the projects. Great. And I guess one kind of reiterating, you did have a slide at the end, but just to review, what news might we expect to have over the coming weeks and months? So there, 
you know, we, we'll have the news of starting. Uh, uh, we have some news from from Batupilas from from the work we've been doing over the last few months. We have um, uh, obviously the the start of drilling at at, at the, uh, Medicine Springs, which will be happening. Uh, we hope uh, in the next uh, few weeks, and um, those, those will be the the, the main uh, news uh, over the phone. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.